When I first began my channel, I originally started it to make critiques of the Halo franchise. At one point, Halo was my favourite franchise, and my videos were originally going to look at the story of Halo Infinite and how I don't think it makes a lot of sense. Those videos are quite old, they definitely aren't edited to my current standards, but I think it was a good starting point, especially as they were made on Windows Movie Maker and a webcam microphone. But there was another bunch of Halo videos that I started to make that were supposed to be part of a bigger playlist. You see, I started to make a long form critique video series called The Garbage Bag, where I would look at a series or movie and break it down, both the good and the bad, before placing them in a ranking list at the end. And for some reason, I decided that the best place to start would be with the Halo TV show. Before we get into that show and how it made the start of my YouTube career utterly miserable, let me give you some context about why I chose Halo in the first place. Now, I've been a pretty big fan of Halo for most of my life. I first played Halo 2 when I was about 7 years old, and after that I was hooked on the series. When I got an Xbox 360, Halo 3 was my primary game, and I would dedicate a lot of time and effort during the Bungie era. This started to take a turn in 2010. Now, before people get annoyed at me thinking that I'm a bungee stan that never gave 343 a chance, let me be perfectly crystal clear here. I do not think Halo Reach is that great as a Halo game. I think the multiplayer strayed too far and I think the story is just terrible. Not that the premise is terrible, just that when you take this story and put it against the rest of the Halo Expanded Universe, it just doesn't add up. And I actually think 343 had a very good and promising start when Halo 4 first released. In fact, while Halo 2 still has my favourite story campaign, I would actually say that Halo 4 is my second favourite of the bunch. I think 343 got critiqued quite heavily when they came into the franchise and I think a lot of people are hesitant to point out the flaws in the Bungie games that I don't think get acknowledged a lot. But that's a discussion for another time. So yeah, Halo 4 was a good start, and while I think the multiplayer was a bit gimmicky and unfocused, I overall enjoyed the game. And then Spartan Ops started. Repetitive gameplay and level designs aside, the main problem that Spartan Ops opened when it was first introduced was that no one had any idea what they wanted to do with the next story. And while the lack of continuation of the story Halo 4 set up into 5 can be excused, I don't think the Spartan Ops story can be. You see, Halo 4 ends with the Didact seemingly defeated by Chief, except the continued presence of the Prometheans and the Didact voiceover gives hints that he wasn't quite dead. But there wasn't anything there that would make me question where he was. And if it wasn't for the fact that I know that they bafflingly chose to kill him off in a comic book instead, I would just assume that at the start of Halo 5 that he was dead from his fall in Halo 4. The same thing can't be said about the Spartan Ops storyline. You see, that story left it open-ended and heavily involved several characters that were going to appear in Halo 5, so I was interested in seeing how this would tie into hunting the Master Chief story that was heavily promoted at the time. Instead, 343 decided to rewrite and change Halo 5 so much to the point where both of these plot points were basically non-existent by the time the game came out with the Spartan Ops story being solved in a comic book and very quickly swept under the rug, while the Hunting the Chief storyline lasted for about two minutes until the evil Cortana story takes over. So what we started to see was the cracking leadership of 343, with it being shown that they struggled to keep a single, cohesive, overarching story going, as well as the fact that they were constantly trying to change aspects of the universe to fit their own design, making the Halo brand more theirs in the process. I became a lot more critical of the Halo series from this point on, and with the release of Halo Infinite, I became a lot more cynical and the franchise stopped being my favourite because it just seemed like it was only getting worse. Which leads us to the Halo TV show. Now, when I first heard about the Halo live action show being put into development, I was over the moon. I mean, a live action Halo being made by one of the most profitable companies in the world and Steven Spielberg? What's not to love about that? Except the show then went through a thorough restructuring process in terms of writers, other pre-production personnel and 343's involvement. Later on, when I'm busy tearing this thing apart, please remember that this thing had to go through 260 different drafts before it was finally allowed to start active production. 260 drafts to try and write a story that was already written for them that they just needed to adapt. And so, despite more and more images and clips being released that was designed to hype us up, I just felt nothing but mistrust for this product. And it was very clear that the Paramount executives, the Microsoft executives, Phil Spencer, Bonnie Ross, and Kiki Wolfkill had absolutely no idea what they were doing. Like, at all. We were told that they wouldn't be adapting the games, and that they wanted to focus on a different story set at a different point in time. Fair enough, an adaption doesn't necessarily need to adapt the story down to the last detail. There's plenty of time throughout the Halo franchise that this story could take place in, so I wasn't too worried. I was just curious about what they would focus on. 
then we were told that this would actually take place in a different continuity than the main timeline, known as the Silver Timeline. Okay, that's a bit of a bummer, but just because a piece of media is in a separate continuity, that doesn't make it inherently bad. The Lord of the Rings trilogy doesn't adapt everything from the books and change a lot of stuff to fit its continuity, and that turned out to be one of the greatest film trilogies of all time. And just to duplicate us further, there was a statement going around by the producers, showrunners, writers and Pablo himself saying that while they had played the games, the stories and settings just weren't clicking for the production, but they were going to remain faithful to what was established in the main timeline, just tell it a little bit differently, which sounds good right? Except they were all absolutely lying through their teeth, and the heavy amount of leaks that were revealed through 4chan and other online sources show that the people behind this had no idea what Halo was. It becomes very clear that this was just a random script that they slapped a Halo theme over to top it off, and then they set out to arbitrarily change as much stuff as possible to make it their own. And I do mean change as much as possible, from the stories to the characters to the world building. You have the superficial changes of course. These are either aesthetic changes or just things that never really had a lot of focus placed on them in the books or the games. For instance, why can jackals use energy swords when energy swords are treated as basically a holy weapon by the elites that only they are allowed to use? Oh well, maybe everyone is just viewed as worthy of wielding them in this continuity. That's not too bad. Or Master Chief taking off his helmet. Now this is a big deal in the games, but in the books there's several times that Chief's face is described and he's unarmoured plenty of times throughout the series. So having a different continuity where we see his face every now and then isn't a big deal, so long as they use it sparingly and they don't shove it in our faces every 5 minutes. And then we move on to the more severe issues with the series. They arbitrarily decided to make the cast a lot younger compared to the original timeline. Because of this, by the time Halsey developed the Spartan program, the Covenant War had already started, which the Spartans were being trained for. Despite this, the UNSC continues to send Spartans to kill rebel farmers instead of helping to stop the Covenant from glassing their planets. Ignoring the fact that this makes the UNSC look completely incompetent in both their goals and leadership, it also makes the moral stakes of the Spartan project completely fucking arbitrary. The reason why the Spartan project was such a compelling moral quandary in the original timeline was because the nature of it and why it was made. During a time where more planetary systems were rebelling and the UNSC was starting to weaken, the UNSC made these Spartans to act like a one man army to neutralise the rebels and keep the UNSC in power in order to stop the complete collapse of their society. The goal was understandable, but the morality behind the project and its mission was a grey area heavily explored both in universe and by the Halo fandom. Another factor of it was that when the Covenant War started, it essentially shook mankind to its core due to the possible end of their species. As such, many rebels chose to reunite with the UNSC in order to have a fighting chance, and the Spartans were slowly twisted from being portrayed as the morally grey assassins into heroic figures leading the charge against the Covenant. The nature of the Spartans and their portrayal throughout history is also a heavily discussed topic, one that caused even more division when their creation and early missions were revealed to the public following the war. The Spartans were ultimately the thing that saved humanity, but does that excuse them and the UNSC of their actions against the insurrectionists decades ago. Meanwhile in the show, the Spartans and the UNSC should be heroic figures from the get go, especially as the Covenant isn't just something that can be covered up in a galaxy where videos can be sent across solar systems, meaning that everyone should have joined together long before the Spartans were even deployed as an offensive unit. Yet for some reason the UNSC chooses to keep attacking potential allies, and the insurrectionists are still hostile against the UNSC and have no idea that nearby planets are being completely destroyed. As such, the nature and actions of the Spartans are ruined by the fact that they are dictated not out of desperation and moral greyness, but by sheer idiotic leadership and lack of common sense. Which is fine I guess, it's not an inherently bad idea, but it just comes across less Halo and more Warhammer 40k. Another major change is just how deadly the Covenant are and how desperate the UNSC is. You see, in both continuities you have three separate layers to mankind's galactic society. You have Earth, the primary core for UNSC and mankind as a whole. You then have the inner colonies, the world settled on that are, in galactic terms, closest to Earth. And then you have the outer colonies, the world's far from Earth and on the outskirts of what is essentially the human empire. In the original timeline, by the year 2552, the UNSC are desperate to hold on to what little they have left. While there are still dozens of small settlements across space, most of their major planets, trading routes and resources have been destroyed, with the only two major settlements left to fight for being Earth and Reach. 
and by the time of the first Halo game, they have just lost Reach, essentially taking place when mankind as a whole is on its last dying breaths after being in a galactic war for 27 years. Despite this, mankind is still fighting and trying to find a way to deal with the Covenant, showing that despite its losses, mankind is still hopeful and determined to fight against them. This is not the case in the show. Somehow, despite constantly saying that they are losing, that they have lost plenty of colonies, and the fact that they are desperate to secure the artifacts so that they can win the war, the outer colonies are still a thing. The primary planet that is focused on in the show is Madrigal, a planet on the outer colonies. In the original timeline, Madrigal, like most of the outer colonies, was wiped out about 20 years before the games take place emphasising both how unprepared the UNSC are and how powerful and advanced the Covenant are. In the show, however, not only is Madrigal completely fine, but most of the inhabitants of the planet have no idea that the Covenant are even a thing, leading to us, an audience, trying to figure out how these people don't know that they're at war when they're essentially stuck slap dab in the middle of an active battlefield. Imagine during World War I that there was a house full of people in the middle of no man's land who had no idea that they were stuck between two massive armies fighting each other. That's what Madrigal is. On top of that, in the early episodes it's emphasised that Miranda, despite her youth, has good relations with the outer colonies, implying that in the current day there's actually quite a lot of planets left in the outer colonies. This makes the context surrounding the UNSC and mankind as a whole come across as rather disjointed. We're supposed to believe that they're in the middle of a brutal war that has been constantly forcing mankind on the defensive, yet it's relegated to the background so much and the stakes of the day-to-day -day battle seem so low that it's difficult to see the Covenant as such a threat. You know how in Fallout New Vegas the NCR are struggling to stop the Legion from taking over Hoover Dam? But you get the sense that if the NCR lose, it'll just be another big setback and the overall government will still continue to function adequately? That's the vibe that this show gives off, when the vibe that it's supposed to give off is that mankind are only a few major battles away from extinction. And then you have the major changes that these troglodytes decide to incorporate into the show. Ones that break either the entire show or the entire purpose of a specific character or object like Marquis, her role in the plot and how she is treated in universe. To give you some context, the whole point of the Covenant is that they worship a group of beings that were known as the Forerunners, viewing these aliens as gods and their creators. While the actual history of the Forerunners had them activate the Halo Rings and wipe out their entire species, all of the sentient life in the universe and the Flood, the Covenant mistranslated a Forerunner text and incorrectly came to the conclusion that they needed to use the Halo Rings to ascend to Godhood, believing that the Forerunners did the same thing. Because of this, the Covenant leadership believed that every species had the chance to become a god and would ascend when the Halo Rings fired, a quest they would call the Great Journey. And until they complete the Great Journey, they would go across the galaxy, indoctrinating others into their order and collecting Forerunner artifacts. When they went to a world they believed would be full of hundreds of thousands of Forerunner artifacts, they discovered humanity instead. The leaders eventually learned that they had mistranslated the text the Forerunners left behind, revealing that not only would no one be ascending to Godhood, but also that humanity was chosen to inherit the technology they left behind. And because of this, the humans on the planet were showing up as Forerunner artifacts. The leaders now had a choice. If they revealed this information, then not only would they lose their power, but it would make everything that the Covenant had gone through redundant. Every planet they had destroyed, every species that they had effectively enslaved, every being that had died in pursuit of the Great Journey would have all been for a lie. Especially when it becomes apparent that humanity can use this technology without restriction, but they can't. Or, they could say that humanity are heretics that need to be eliminated in pursuit of the Great Journey keeping their power and the Covenant intact. And of course, while some were hesitant and couldn't understand why the Prophets wouldn't let humanity into the Covenant, most of the Covenant believed that this is what their gods wanted, and so they went about their mission without question. So, to sum up what I'm trying to tell you, in the eyes of the Covenant, especially those that have no position of power and are merely soldiers, any action towards humanity that isn't to destroy them on sight is heresy and would be punishable by death. If you see a human, you either capture them and torture them, or you kill them. If you see a human building or structure, you blow it up. And if you're on the battlefield, run out of ammo, and the two choices that you are given are either run at the enemy gunfire with your fists, or use a human weapon to defend yourself, you might as well use your fists, because the second you touch that human weapon you'll be executed for heresy. So when I first heard that Marquis was going to be a character in the show, and I saw the leaks detailing what she would be doing and what her role in the story would be, I didn't initially believe the leaks, because there's no way someone could write something so awful. I was wrong to dismiss the leaks. Marquis is a human child that was raised by the Covenant to hate humanity and help them with their mission to find the Halo Arrays. 
Now while I think the idea of raising her like she's one of their own is a stupid idea, the overall idea could have been a lot more tolerable if they just made her a secret prisoner that only a select few knew about. This way it could help justify how the Covenant gains new information throughout its story by bringing the artifacts to the Prophets, who in turn would force Marquis to use them and give them information. It's not the best fix, but it's something. The show didn't do this. Instead, they had Marquis being very out in the open and known by many members of the Covenant, from the Prophets down to the Foot Soldiers. This fucks up the background of the Covenant by stripping it of any nuance and tragedy that the original games gave it. As I mentioned, in the original timeline, only a select few knew about humanity's purpose and the lie of the Covenant. Everyone else genuinely believed that humanity was an enemy of their gods, and that killing them was the right thing to do because their gods demanded it. They were too blinded by their religion to ask questions and attempt to seek answers for why they were fighting in the war. Probably the best storyline in this franchise, at least for me, is how the Arbiter and the rest of the Covenant react when news comes out that their religion is a lie and that everything they had done throughout the Human Covenant War was meaningless. You have the Loyalists, the Covenant led by the Prophets and the Brutes, who could not come to terms with what was revealed to them and chose to ignore this evidence and continue as they did before, the truth and their hatred being too much for them to comprehend. Others, like the Arbiter, chose to try and seek some level of atonement, even if they acknowledged that they will most likely never be able to make up for what they've done. Destined to try and make the galaxy a safe and prosperous place after decades of war and centuries of enslaving each other. Some, realising that everything they killed and destroyed due to their blind beliefs were innocent, chose to take their own lives so they would never harm anyone else again, the shame of their actions being something they couldn't overcome. And then you have other factions that splintered off from these, whether it be Covenant that doesn't really care about fighting humanity but still worships the Forerunners, to members who have been fighting for so long they cannot stop, choosing to become hired mercenaries to both humanity and the rest of the Covenant factions. Seeing the members of the Covenant react in all these different ways after the tragedy of their actions was revealed to them was amazing storytelling with so much potential, and it also allowed us to see a more heroic side to them in the aftermath. All of this the show cannot do. When you have a Covenant that not only knows that its entire religion is fake, has them casually interact with a human without question, and have no issues with the fact that they cannot use the artifacts but humanity can, I struggle to understand what the entire point of both this war and the show is. Because if the Covenant are aware of all these things, it means that the entire point of the war on this show is that the aliens are just evil because they have no reason to be at war with humanity besides shits and giggles. So now, as I mentioned at the start, I tried to focus on the Halo franchise as the content of my channel, and as such I decided to do this show as the start of a big series that I wanted to bring to my channel. Those issues I just mentioned, they were only a few of the staggering amount of issues that I had from the very first two episodes. I made scripts for the first, second and third episodes of the show. I fully voice recorded, and released the first episode in two parts. I then got screwed over by phony copyright and had to drastically change these videos. I fully voiced the second episode, fully edited and released the first part, and this time I was savvy enough to work on the video properly in terms of copyright. But after that, I just couldn't do anymore. I could easily edit the second part of the second episode, but I just don't want to. Most of the videos I've made on this channel, I've enjoyed making them. Even the Man of Steel episodes have been quite enjoyable. But this series? I watched the episodes two at a time originally so I could write my scripts with my first impressions, and if anything contradicted this in later episodes I would deal with it then. But after doing my episode 2 video I decided to just binge watch the rest and reassure myself that this series was too awful for me to break down and enjoy doing it. And I was right. The stupid memory loss decision, the constant helmet removals, the constant angst that surrounds every character that interacts with Halsey, the constant helmet removals, the terrible expository dialogue, the sex scene where Chief unlawfully rapes an enemy prisoner, Cortana being cooked, Chief being a pussy and needing Cortana to do his job for him, the constant helmet removals. So let's give a round of applause to Paramount for releasing this show a show that quite clearly has more in common with Mass Effect than it does with the source material it claims inspired it. A show that sacrifices all of its story development, character arcs, world building and nuance for the sake of streamlining everything into a little box of shallowness and making everything about drama. What picture does the Season 2 promotional material paint for the series going forward? Still not a good one. I mean these are the fucking posters, and this is the first shot of the first trailer. If you thought that the weird Cortana takes control of his mind plot at the end of the first season was actually going to have Chief act like Chief, just no, it's not. The season also seems to be trying to depict the fall of Reach, showing humanity taking a major loss before going to visit the Halo ring. I'm sorry but am I supposed to take this as a serious plot point? 
You literally open the series with the outer colonies being fine and not having any idea that the Covenant is even a thing. And now you expect me to believe the Covenant have magically steamrolled all of the outer colonies, most of the inner colonies, and are now knocking on Reach's doorstep? Season 2 still takes place in 2552, right? But you're telling me that the Covenant has managed to do something in a matter of weeks or months that they somehow couldn't do over the course of 27 years? You see, this is the overall problem of the Halo series going forward that is going to make any attempts at goodwill completely pointless in the future. They are trying to make the show more gritty. They are trying to build up how terrifying the Covenant are. They are trying to do an adaption of an actual major Halo storyline. But the fact is that everything they're building up to is going to be built from the first season. That season still exists. And so if they continue off of it, then all of the problems associated with its story and characters are still going to affect the later seasons. If you're a Halo fan, and you think the season is looking good and thinking about watching it, that's fine. I applaud you for giving it another chance. But let me explain my point of view on this show, and to any future seasons it might have. When building a house, you can choose to make it out of the most expensive and durable materials you can get. You can hire the best architect to design it to be absolutely perfect and the best builders to build it in a way that it will stand for decades without needing any repairs. But at the end of the day, no matter how perfect the house is, it's absolutely irrelevant if the foundation that you lay the house on is made up of mud, shit and straw. Because the second you try and build the house on that foundation, it's just going to sink in on itself and collapse. Season 1 is that foundation, so why would I care about anything that's built on top of it? Thanks for watching lads and lasses, if you enjoyed this video please consider liking, subscribing and checking out some of my other videos. Sharing my videos is a big help and if you're feeling really generous please consider my Patreon or YouTube membership. But overall I just hope you had a great day and hopefully I will see you in the next video.